All right, uh, take your Bible. How many, uh, does anybody know where I stopped last week on this? Testing you out here. No, the truth is, I can't remember either. <laughs> huh? Was it verse 8? Who shall confirm you unto then, blameless in the let day of the Lord Jesus Christ? Alright, so we'll pick up verse 9 this morning. Alright, let's go to the Lord in prayer before we get started. Lord, I pray that you'll take in a bless the service this morning. I pray that you'll bless the preaching of your word. I pray that you'll take and uh, give each and every individual that came this morning something from your word. Something that will help them. Something that will comfort them. Will strengthen them in their faith. Will draw them closer to you. And I pray that the judgment seat of Christ that we all will hear, well done thou good and faithful servant. And we all will take and do the things that are pleasing in your eyes. And in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Alright, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and verse 8. It says, who shall... I mean, verse 9. It says, God is faithful. God keeps His word, amen? amen. God is faithful. Say, so what does that mean? That means if He said it, you can count on it. Right. That, that means He'll deliver. Right. He's faithful. You, you can count on it. The Bible says, um, many will proclaim their own righteousness, but a faithful man, who can find? Faithful is somebody that you can count on. Somebody you can depend on. God is faithful. He's faithful. By whom ye were also called unto the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now, if you are saved, you are called unto the fellowship of His Son. Matter of fact, if you weren't saved, you are called to that. God's calling you. It's just if you listen to the call. God wants every. The Bible says that the Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Um, the Bible very clearly. We'll try to take your Bible and turn to um, Revelation. I think it's this ain't in my notes, but turn to Revelation chapter twenty-two. Revelation chapter 22. This is it says, um, let me get verse uh, 17. Well, let, I'll get verse 16. It says, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and offspring of David and the bright and morning star. And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. You know what that is? That's the Lord Jesus Christ saying, you know what? I want you with me. I want you to dine at my table. I want you, if you're thirsty, to come. Whosoever will. Whosoever will. If you die and go to hell and you're separated from God for eternity and burning in the lake of fire for eternity, guess what? That's your fault, not His. It's not what He wanted. You say, God didn't give way? No, because He gave you a free will and He won't abuse it. Yeah. Yes, sir. Is there, is there ever any explanation of why those passages which put in the end of Revelation, those church age passages, is there any... Well, any that's not just a church age passage, brother. That, that's for anyone. Yeah, that's, all. that's for all men. Okay? 
But, I mean, it definitely will apply to church age. Yeah, that's, that's what it definitely, it's a summary. It's a summary at the end of the book. Okay. It's the end of the Bible, and it's a summary. Whosoever will, let him come and take of the water of life freely. Now, now there's some things that ain't free, but the water of life is free for all. Yeah, right. uh, and even, even in the tribulation. When it comes to Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ is free. The testimony of Jesus Christ is free. That's not something that the tribulation saint is earning. Yeah, he has to endure to the end of, of his, uh, the tribulation to take him and not take the mark. That's his work, but that has nothing to do with Jesus Christ. That has to do with him not taking the mark of the beast. Jesus Christ is free. He doesn't make somebody work to receive him. And his atonement. His work he did for them. He's free. And whosoever will let him come and take of the water of life freely. When he talks to the woman at the well. In John chapter 4. He says I give unto thee. The water. The water that I give thee. That's a free gift. Jesus Christ is a free gift to all. So when you go back and you look at Revelation. Revelation chapter 17, it says, in the Spirit and the Bride, now that's the Bride, that's the church age, saying, come, and let him that come, uh, let him that heareth say, come, anyone that hears, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, whosoever will. He goes, he goes to Cain, if thou doest well, shalt thou be accepted? You know what put men, people in hell? The will. The will. You get what you will. You get what you want. I don't want Christ. Okay, you don't get Him. It's up to you. It's up to you. There's a lot of people that's going to wind up at the great white throne judgment. And have to deal with the reality that God offered Himself to them, but they rejected Him. You know ultimately what will happen at the great white throne? Lord, you're right, it's my fault. You're right, it's my fault. Every one of them. There won't be any excuses. No excuse. Anyways, that's a sidetrack. Let's get on back to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. God is faithful, but by whom ye were called unto the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now the Lord wants to have fellowship with you. And you are called unto fellowship when you get saved. So, when you get saved, you're saved from hell and you become a child of God. But you know what? God wants to spend time with you. He wants fellowship with you. Fellowship is just spending time with someone. That's what fellowship is. Being able to talk to them, being able to spend time with them, take time to spend with them. You enjoy fellowship. I, I like to enjoy my Saturdays with my kids. I do. I enjoy spending time with my kids. I invite any one of them to go fishing with me early in the morning. Now very few, seldom do they want to get up at 5 o'clock and go fishing with me. But, <laughs> but any one of them's welcome to do that. You know? <laughs> Why? Because I enjoy time with them. I enjoy that time. I mean, if you're a father and you don't enjoy hanging out with your kids, man... I don't know about you. I don't know about you. And when you get saved, you're a child of God, and He wants fellowship with you. Now, look at, um, take your Bible, and look at, um, let's go to um, Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3, and let's pick up verse 6. Ephesians chapter 3.
and verse 6. It says that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs, that's us, fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Wherefore I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God, even unto me by the effectual working of his power, unto me who am less than the least of all saints in this grace, given that I should preach unto the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see, now look at it, what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things in Christ, by Christ Jesus, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church of God the manifold wisdom of God. Alright, so what is that? That's you getting saved. You being with Christ and seated with Christ in heavenly places. That's the fellowship of the mystery. I get saved, I'm in Christ, Christ is in me, and I have fellowship with Him. That's the mystery of Christ in me, the hope of glory. You know? You're called to that fellowship. So your fellowship starts with salvation. It's the mystery of Christ in you. Take your Bible and turn to Philippians. Philippians chapter 1. Look at verse 5 and 6. Philippians chapter 1. Verse 5 and 6. It says, For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he which began a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. So as soon as you got saved, your fellowship with Christ started. As soon as you got saved, you became in Christ and your fellowship started. Now not all people that are saved has close fellowship with the Lord. You know, I mean, close fellowship is when you have that desire to draw close to the Lord. And with that, there comes requirements. I mean, as a father, if your child is constantly disobeying you and grieving you, you know what's soon going to happen? The fellowship will draw apart. It will draw apart. You cannot be close to someone who despises you and despises what you're trying to tell them. You can't. It messes up the fellowship. It doesn't eliminate the sonship, but it messes up the fellowship. I mean, if my kids grow up and they want to take and go to the bar all the time, if they want to take and go down to doing this wicked thing or that wicked thing and take and hang out with the lost and go do and go... I don't know, join the Catholic Church or some other church that disagrees with me. You know what? That, it's going to drive a wedge of fellowship between us. Okay? Why? Because there's disagreement. The Bible says, can two walk together lest they be agreed? Amos 3.3. 3. The answer to that is no, they cannot. Fellowship is walking together, hanging around. You know who you hang... No, there's an old phrase. Birds of a feather flock together. Okay? You know why we gather together? Because we think alike. Alright? Birds of a feather flock together. Now let's put that with you in Christ. You want to be close to Christ? Well then you have to think like Christ. You have to be in agreement with Christ. You have to agree with Him and walk with Him. I'll, I'll give you a clue. He's not going to change His position to be close to you. You're going to have to change yours to be close to Him. You want to get closer to Christ? You have to be in agreement with Christ. Alright, here's the things. Here's some things that will help you draw closer to Christ in fellowship. Number one, living righteous. Living righteous. So you know what the first thing you have to do after you get saved? You become a child of God and now you want to close, draw close to God? Alright, start living righteous. Amen. Start quitting sin. Amen. 
If you continue in your sin and will not deal with the sin that's in your life, you won't draw close to God. Because God, God, God doesn't like sin. So yes, the Christian life is about fighting sin and getting victory over sin. It's, a, it's one where you strive to take and be sinless or remove sin from your life. Yeah, um, take your Bible and turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Now I understand that in this flesh we'll never truly be sinless. But I don't think you should ever quit trying. You should always try. 2 Corinthians, and the Lord's understanding too. Lord's understanding. He's going to help you with that. He'll be gracious with you on that. But take your Bible and turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Look at verse 14. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. It says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers? For what fellowship, there it is, hath righteousness with unrighteousness? Okay? Now Jesus Christ is called the righteous. He's the righteous one. He's the sinless one. You want to have fellowship with Him? You have to be righteous. Because what fellowship have righteousness with unrighteousness? You're going to go live like the devil? Well, you're not going to have fellowship with the Lord. The Lord and the devil, they don't like hanging around out together. They don't agree. Okay? They just don't. Okay, you got to choose which one. Fellowship have righteousness with unrighteousness. What communion have light with darkness? And what concord have Christ with Belial? Say, what's Belial? The sons of Belial are the sons of rebellion. That's the sons of the devil. Belial is the devil. Okay? And what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? You know, guys at work have always invited me to go to parties and do all this stuff with them. I've never been able to go. Why? Because I can't have fellowship with that stuff. You know what? I've always invited them to church. They can't seem to come. Why? Because they don't have fellowship with this stuff. Isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful, wonderful, wonderful? And that lost man work will look at me like, he's lost his mind. You know, I ain't going to quit singing just so I don't feel comfortable here. I come here, I'm going to sing the praises of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not going to make him feel comfortable at church. It's about Jesus Christ, not, the, not what the lost enjoys. You know, that lost man does not feel comfortable in this building. And if he does, something's wrong. Something's wrong. Because what fellowship have, um, here it is, fellowship. What the, uh, I lost my place here. Verse 16, And what agreement hath, uh, what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? Okay. That lost man, that saved man, they're not going get, to get along together. You, you know why I uh, don't try to be part of the ecumenical movement? You want to know why? Because I want to be close to Christ. And if they want to be close to me, they got to get close to Christ too. Amen. I'm not going to withdraw myself from Christ so I can be close to them. Amen. Not going to happen. Okay? Believe it with an infidel. And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, and God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be their... Be my people. You know, Christ is living in you. There's a certain place Christ doesn't belong, and neither do you. If Christ is inside you, you don't belong certain places. Okay? Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Most un unpreached doctrine of today from pulpits is separation. 
You need to separate. I'm not saying not witness to them, not trying to show them the love of Christ, not trying to show them the light of Jesus Christ and the light of the Christian life. I'm not telling you not to do that. Otherwise, then we'd have to go up and be like a monk or a monastery up in the woods and completely remove ourselves, which some people try to do, but I'm not agreeing with that. But you, but you don't go out and hang out with them. Okay? Separate yourself. Realize, you're a Christian. If they want to hang out with you, then they need to become a Christian and put Christ first. Receive Jesus Christ as their Savior. Love righteousness. Love the Bible. Love the hymns of the praises of the Lord Jesus Christ. Love the things of God. You want to draw close to God? Then you've got to draw... Well, like this. Here's separation. It's very easy. Here's separation. You got the world and you got the throne. Jesus Christ is on the throne. If you're going to be there, you have to leave the world. If you draw close to the world, you leave the throne. You get to decide where you're going to be. Simple as that. Simple as that. You know what a lot of Christians do? They get saved, they step out of the world, but they stay right there. That's, that's as close to the Lord as they ever get. They stay right there. Don't do that. Don't be that Christian. Draw close to the Lord. But you've got to leave the world to do that. Alright. Um, so, uh, you have to love righteousness. Turn to 1 John chapter 1, verse 6. Now, you want a good chapter on fellowship? If you want a chapter on fellowship, go to 1 John chapter 1. Hyper-dispensationalists don't have fellowship with the Lord because they ignore verse John chapter 1 and say it doesn't apply to them. That's why I'm not a hyper-dispensationalist. I want to draw close to the Lord. I, I, I'm getting off on the hyper-dispensationalists. I mean, I, I made the mistake. I started taking talking to Christians online. And the hyper-dispensationalists are huge among Bible believers online. They're huge. I, I didn't... Realize there are so many hyper dispensationalists out there. But you know what a hyper dispensationalist does? He tries to take and steal the Word of God from you, so you will take and only focus on a small section of it. And you will not apply the rest of Scripture to you. So you know what he does? He'll steal the book of John and 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John and 1st and 2nd Peter from you. And those are some great books for you to learn from. Or the book of James. We're, we're teaching on the book of James. I understand doctrine, but I also understand if you want to draw close to Christ, you better be spiritual. You better be spiritual. Yes, sir. What do they, what do they say about those books? They say that they're kingdom gospel books and they do not apply to you. So a big memory that they like is that they'll put these two mailboxes up. They say they don't, you cannot apply them to the church age at all. Where do they get that? Where do they get it? They get it from a guy named Bollinger and Stam. The Bollinger's Common Bible. Or Stam. And the, those were two major ones. Cornelius Stam. What does that say? Huh? What does Bollinger say that takes them out of the church age? I don't know. He always put me asleep so I couldn't read his whole full thing. <laughs> I mean, that's... I, I've just been learning to. <laughs> I, I don't really want to know if I ever faced that. Well, the way you'll spot them. All right. So when Jesus Christ came preaching, John, they came preaching the kingdom of heaven, right? So what they'll do, they'll say that the kingdom gospel is the gospel given to the Jews. So they'll call it the kingdom gospel. And they'll say that the kingdom gospel is goes on past the cross because the Jews went past the cross. And it isn't the church doesn't start until Paul starts. So they'll start the church in Acts chapter some of them are Acts chapter 9, but they'll start with Paul. So if you see a guy 
And that's overemphasizing the Gospel of Paul versus the Gospel of the Kingdom. What he does is he'll say, John, the book of John, and Peter were disciples that were sent to the Jews. So they're preaching the Kingdom Gospel in 1st, 2nd, 3rd John and the book of John. And the things that the book of John in 1st, 2nd, 3rd John does not apply to you. Well, what's in John? John's main, what's the theme of John? I won't be preaching on this. What's the theme of John? The theme of John is the deity of Jesus Christ. So I'm sitting here with the, arguing with this guy. He's a hyper dispensational. He's saying the deity of Christ is not part of our gospel. Wow. You idiot. Yes, it is. Yeah. yeah. How many of you believe the deity of Christ is part of the gospel? I mean, come on. Well, who are you believing in? The resurrection proves. The deity of the gospel is about Jesus Christ. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ preached by the Paul. They say, "Well, we're under the gospel of the grace of God." The God, Paul's gospel of the grace of God is the gospel of grace. Don't you realize the gospel of the grace is the gospel of Jesus Christ? They're the same. <laughs> I mean, yes, sir. Oh, well, you got me going now, so now you have to, now, now you have to deal with it. I mean, this is hyper, but that's hyper dispensationalist, brother. That what they, you, you'll spot them. That, now, here's the fruits. Here's the fruits of a hyper dispensation. If you really want to spot one, you ask them, do you believe that you need to confess your sins after you're saved? They'll say no. Because they don't go 1 John chapter 1. Do you, you ask them, do you believe that you should be baptized as a Christian? They'll say no. Dr. Ruckman called them dry cleaners. Yes, sir. Yeah, John, do you don't ignore John. You don't ignore John. John took and John preached, John's gospel shows that Jesus Christ was God and they died for you. It, it shows what Christ came for. That's the main theme of the gospel of John. Now take your Bible and turn, going back to fellowship, go to 1 John chapter 1. I'm sorry I got off on them. I, he asked me what's a hyper dispensationalist. They, they've really pushed my buttons a little bit and got me going with them. Because I mean, I, I just can't believe the damage that they do. Hyper dispensationalists are damaged and they only pray, they pray on Bible believers that are not because we, they divide, but they over-divide. No, so they, they, they'll hit a group like this. You are the ones they'll target. And they'll target you online. That's what they're doing. They're getting their converts and followers online. And uh, I mean, that's a lot of the preachers will say, don't go online. They're preaching against Facebook. Why? Because they don't want some hyper-dispensationalist get a hold of you. That's what they're doing. Uh, take your Bible and turn to 1 John chapter 1. Now, about fellowship. Here's the great chapter. A great chapter on fellowship. This has to do with your fellowship with Jesus Christ. It says, That which was from the beginning, which he have heard, which we have seen, which our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled, the word of life, that's Jesus Christ, for the life was manifest, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with, Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. That Word was Jesus Christ. So uh, he was with the Father and was manifest unto him. God was manifest in the flesh. That's the deity of Jesus Christ. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you 
that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And that's what God wants from you. He wants your fellowship. He, he wants you to be close to Him. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. You want to be happy for the rest of your life? Have fellowship with Jesus Christ. Amen. True joy comes in close fellowship with the Lord. That's where your joy and peace comes from. This then is the message which we have heard of Him and declare unto you, that God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. And if we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. In other words, you can't be unrighteous and have fellowship with Him. It doesn't work. If we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Alright, so what's, here's the problem. In your flesh, you're still in a body of sin. If you say you have no sin, you're, just, you're deceiving yourself. You're not deceiving God. Okay? So you know what God wants you to do? He wants you to deal with your sin. He wants you to deal with your sin. How do you say, preacher, how do I deal with my sin? Verse 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him a liar, and His Word is not in us. So what's going to happen, when you get saved, the Holy Spirit comes inside of you. Each time you sin, the Holy Spirit says, you shouldn't have done that, that's a sin. That grieves me. You grieve the Holy Spirit of God which is inside you. That grieves me. You know what you just did by committing that sin? You broke our fellowship. You broke fellowship with me by doing that. Say, Lord, but I want to have fellowship with you. Okay, then confess your sins and put it under the blood. If you come and ask for forgiveness, I'll forgive for you and we can draw close again, but you've got to ask for forgiveness for that. So you get down as a Christian, every time you sin, you say, Lord, that was dumb. That was a sin. I sinned and did this. I know it was a sin. I know I shouldn't have done that. Will you please forgive me? And I'll try not to do that again. I'm sorry. Will you please wash me in your blood? They'll say, okay, I forgive you. I forgive you. Let, let's go on. We're, we're past this. We'll move on. And then your fellowships are story, you draw closer to the Lord. Your entire Christian life will be that way. You'll have to fight sin until you die. But you have to deal with it. And don't let it become a controversy between you and the Lord. Deal with your sin. Fight your sin. And, and here's the thing. That's repentance of the saved. Repentance of the saved is when you look at that sin and don't justify it. And say, my sin just caused me to lack fellowship with the Lord. So you change your mind about that sin and you turn away from that sin and you turn toward God. That's the repentance of the saved. There's a repentance of the lost, which is kind of the same thing. Where you recognize that you're a sinner in need of a Savior. And you turn from your sin to your Savior. But there's also repentance of the saved to recognize your sin. You know how you can tell when a saved man won't repent? He'll justify his sin. You know how you tell when a lost man won't repent? He justifies his sin. They do the same thing. They do the same thing. I use 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 on lost man. Why well, wouldn't? What? Because they're so close to the same. It's so close to the same. And, uh, and so that fellowship, you deal with that sin. And you turn from it. You know what a lot of Christians need to do? They need to repent of their sin. And turn back to God. Why? So they can have fellowship. So they can have fellowship. With the Lord. Don't take 1 John chapter 1 and say, that doesn't apply to me. Yes, it does. That applies to you. And, uh, and apply it to yourself. You want to have fellowship? Confess your sins. Number three, if you want to have close fellowship with the Lord, 
be willing to suffer for him. Now that one's tough. Why? Because you're willing to take and go through with the Lord through the fire. There's three Hebrew children. They got real close to the Lord. Where did they get close to the Lord? In the fire. That's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar's looking in the fire. They want to take him bow and worship Nebuchadnezzar's image. They weren't careful about that matter. They said, you know what? Even if the Lord doesn't deliver us, we won't bow. We're not going to worship. We're not even careful about this, King Nebuchadnezzar. We will not bow. He says, okay, I'm going to throw you in the fire. Your God that is so important to you that you won't worship my image, in the fire you go. So they went in the fire, and Nebuchadnezzar looked. Didn't we just throw three men in the fire? Uh, yes, sir. Why do I see four? Why do I see four? Why? Because them three guy got three got close to the Lord. They're having good fellowship. I like the way I like the way uh, Lester Olaf sings it on his song. Um, where he says, run if you want to, run if you will. But I came here to say, he, he has a verse about the three Hebrew children. He says, pull up, a boy, uh, pull up a seat, boys, and have a seat with me in the fire. Yeah, pull up a seat. I'm going to have fellowship with you. Now take your Bible, and you say, that, well, that's not, that's not true, preacher. All right, take your Bible and turn to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. You want to have fellowship with the Lord? Well, then learn to have fellowship in His sufferings. Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. That I may know Him and the power of His resurrection, and here it is, and the fellowship of His sufferings, being made conformable unto His death. You say, preacher, what's the fellowship of His sufferings? Fellowship of his suffering is when the world will persecute you and the devil persecutes you and the devil's against you and the world's against you and they afflict you and you say, Lord, now I know how you feel. I see things a little more clearly now. I, I understand what it means to suffer but still do what's right. I, I know I understand what it means to suffer for a better cause, a higher cause. You know, I, I've I've dealt with some suffering in my life. You know what I found about suffering? If suffering is handled right, it draws you closer to Jesus Christ. If it's handled right. There's two things suffering will do in your life. It will either destroy you or draw you closer to Christ. That's one of the two things they'll do. And it depends on how you handle it. You want to draw close to the Lord Jesus Christ? You're going to have to go through some suffering. Why? Because the closer you draw to the Lord Jesus Christ, the more the devil takes note of you. Now you hear it? Uh, some of the old timers, they'd say it this way. You draw close to the Lord, you draw close to the devil. I don't know if that's actually the best way to say it. But I will say this. If you draw close to the Lord, the devil's attention gets perked. You know, there's a lot of Christians the devil doesn't even care about. Why? Because they're so far, far away from the Lord Jesus Christ, the devil's like, oh, they're no threat. You start, giving, you start giving the Lord honor and glory and praise, the devil can't stand that. He looks at you and says, i got to stop that guy. I got to stop that guy. And, and then he starts getting upset. You know why the devil took no. Uh, the Lord asked the devil, Hast thou considered my jo servant Job? The devil's answer was, Yeah, I've considered him. Does he, does he serve you for naught? You know what the devil says? The devil says, Well, you just treat him too good. He won't serve you if you let, let me have Adam. 
You think the devil has changed his tactics? He's going to look at you and say, the Lord's going to say, hey, that guy's always praising me, always serving me, always preaching in my name. Have you ever considered my servant? And he'll say, the devil will say, yeah. Let me have him. Let me have him for a little bit. The Lord says, well, I know my servant. We're, we're close. You go ahead and try. You go ahead and try. I know what I'll do. You're going to suffer. You're going to suffer. Jesus Christ said, if you suffer with me, you shall also reign with me. You say, well, preacher, I thought when I became a Christian, God would protect me from all suffering. Oh no. Oh no. The Christian life is a life of suffering. And when you get saved and go to heaven then it's a time of pleasures forevermore. And the suffering that you have is just, you'll look back and you say, man, that was so little. Why, why didn't I make such a big deal of that? In the, per, in the perspective of eternity, yeah. it'll look like so little. But boy, hindsight is so much better than foresight. It don't look like that when you're going through it. Alright, let's uh, take a break there. Let's take a break there.